Listen to this observation by the great mental science practitioner of the early 20th century. His name was Thomas Troward. Quote, The law of flotation was not discovered by contemplating the sinking of things, but by contemplating the floating of things which floated naturally and then intelligently asking why they did so. Unquote. In the early days of shipbuilding, ships were made of wood, and the reasoning was that wood floats in water and iron sinks. Yet today, ships all over the world are built of iron. As people began studying the law of flotation, it was discovered that anything could float if it's lighter than the mass of liquid it displaces. So today, we're able to make iron float by the very same law that made it sink. Keep this example in mind as you listen and apply the contents of this chapter on connecting to all that you're intended to become. The key word here is contemplating, or what you're placing your thoughts on as you begin utilizing the enormous potential and the power of intention. You must be able to connect to intention, and you can't access and work with intention if you're contemplating the impossibility of being able to intend and manifest. You can't discover the law of co-creation if you're contemplating what's missing. You can't discover the power of awakening if you're contemplating things that are still asleep. The secret to manifesting anything that you desire is your willingness and your ability to realign yourself so that your inner world is in harmony with the power of intention. Every single modern advance that you see and take for granted was created, and creating is what we're doing here in this chapter, by someone contemplating what they intend to manifest. The way to establish a relationship with spirit and access the power of this creating principle is to continuously contemplate yourself as being surrounded by the conditions you wish to produce. Dwell on the idea of a supreme, infinite power producing the results that you desire. This power is the creative power of the universe. It's responsible for everything coming into focus. By trusting it to provide the form and the conditions for its manifestation, you establish a relationship to intention that allows you to be connected for as long as you practice this kind of personal intent. Entering into the spirit of intention. Whatever you intend to create in your life involves generating the same life-giving quality that brings everything into existence. The spirit of anything, the quality that allows it to come into the world of form, is true as a general principle. So why not activate it within yourself? The power of intention simply awaits your ability to make the connection. How do you enter into the spirit of intention, which is all about feelings expressing life? You can nurture it by your continual, ongoing expectation of the infallible spiritual law of increase being a part of your life. We saw it through our imaginary capacity to see higher vibrations, and we heard it in the voice given to it by spiritual masters throughout the ages. It's everywhere. It wants to express life. It's pure love in action. It's confident. And guess what? You are it. But you've forgotten that. You need to simply trust your ability to cheerfully rely upon spirit to express itself through and for you. Your task is to contemplate the energies of life, love, beauty, and kindness. Every action that's in harmony with this originating principle of intention gives expression to your own personal power of intention. Applying the seven faces for connecting to intention. Having been in the business of human development for most of my life, the question I most frequently hear is, how do I go about getting what I want? At this juncture of my life, as I sit here recording this, my response is, if you become what you think about, and what you think about is getting what you want, then you'll stay in a state of wanting. So the answer to how to get what you want is to reframe the question. How do I go about getting what I intend to create or co-create? My answer to that question is in the remainder of this chapter. But my short answer is this. You get what you intend to create by being in harmony with the power of intention, which is responsible for all of creation. Underline that in your mind. I'll say it again. You get what you intend to create by being in harmony with the power of intention, which is responsible for all of creation. So, begin to remove that ego burden from your shoulders and reconnect to intention. When you lay your ego aside and return to that from which you originally emanated, you'll begin to immediately see the power of intention working with, for, and through you in a multitude of ways. Here are those seven faces revisited to help you to begin to make them a part of your life. First, be creative. 
Being creative means trusting your own purpose and having an attitude of unbending intent in your daily thoughts and activities. Staying creative means giving form to your personal intentions. A way to start giving them form is to literally put them in writing. For instance, in my writing space here on Maui, I've written out my intentions, and here are a few of them that stare at me each day as I write. My intention is for all of my activities to be directed by spirit. My intention is to love and radiate my love to my writing and any who might hear these words. My intention is to trust in what comes through me and to be a vehicle of spirit, judging none of it. My intention is to recognize the spirit as my source and to detach from my ego. My intention is to do all that I can to elevate the collective consciousness to be more closely in rapport with the spirit of the originating supreme power of intention. To express your creativity and put your own intentions into the world of the manifest, I recommend that you practice something called japa, a technique first offered by the ancient Vedas. Japa meditation is the repetition of the sound of the names of God while simultaneously focusing on what you intend to manifest. Repeating the sound within the name of God while asking for what you want generates creative energy to manifest your desires. And your desires are the movement of the universal mind within you. Now you may be skeptical about the feasibility of such an undertaking. Well, I ask you to open yourself up to this idea of japa as an expression of your creative link to intention. I won't describe the method in depth here because I've written an entire book about it with an accompanying CD by Hay House called Getting in the Gap. Making Conscious Contact with God Through Meditation, and I urge you to read that and practice it. For now, just know that I consider meditating and practicing japa essential in the quest to realign yourself with the power of intention. That power is creation, and you need to be in your own unique state of creativity to collaborate with the power of intention. Meditation and japa are surefire ways to do so. Secondly, be kind. A fundamental attribute of the supreme originating power is called kindness. All that's manifested is brought here to thrive. It takes a kindly power to want what it creates to thrive and multiply. Were this not the case, then all that's created would be destroyed by the same power that created it. In order to reconnect to intention, you must be on the same kindness wavelength as intention itself. Make an effort to live in cheerful kindness. It's a much higher energy than sadness or malevolence and it makes the manifestation of your desires possible. It's through giving that we receive. It's through acts of kindness directed toward others that our immune systems are strengthened and even our serotonin levels increased. This idea of extending kindness is particularly relevant in how you deal with people who are helpless, elderly, mentally challenged, poor, disabled, and so on. These people are all part of God's perfection. They too have a divine purpose, and since all of us are connected to each other through spirit, their purpose and intent is also connected to you. Extend thoughts of kindness everywhere. Practice kindness towards earth by picking up a piece of litter that's on your path or saying a silent prayer of gratitude for the existence of rain, the color of flowers, or even the paper that you hold in your hand that was donated by a tree. The universe responds in kind to what you elect to radiate outward. If you say with kindness in your voice and in your heart, How may I serve you? The universe's response will be, how may I serve you as well? It's called attractor energy. It's this spirit of cooperation with all of life that emerges from the essence of intention. And this spirit of kindness is one that you must learn to match if connecting back to intention is your desire. My daughter Summer has written from her experience about how small acts of kindness go a long way. Here's what she said in an essay she wrote. I was getting off the turnpike one rainy afternoon, and I pulled up to the toll booth while fumbling through my purse. The woman smiled at me and said, The car before you has paid your toll. I told her I was traveling alone and extended my money. She replied, Yes, the man instructed me to tell the next person who came to my booth to have a brighter day. That small act of kindness did give me a brighter day. I felt so moved by someone I would never know, I began to wonder how I could brighten someone else's day. I called my best friend and told her about my paid toll. She said she'd never thought of doing that, but it was a great idea. She goes to the University of Kentucky and decided to pay for the person behind her every day on her way to school as she exits the toll road. I laughed at her sincerity. You think I'm kidding, she said, but like you said, it's only 50 cents. As we hung up, I wondered if the man who paid my toll even fathomed that his thoughtfulness would travel all the way to Kentucky. 
I had an opportunity to extend kindness at the supermarket one day when I had my cart filled to the top with food that my roommate and I would share over the next two weeks. The woman behind me had an antsy toddler and not nearly as much in her cart as I had. I said to her, why don't you go first? You don't have nearly as much as I do. The woman looked at me as if I just sprouted extra limbs or something. She replied, thank you so much. I haven't seen many people around here be thoughtful of another person. We've moved here from Virginia and are considering moving back because we're questioning whether this is the right place to raise our three children. Then she told me that she was about ready to give up and move back home, even though it would create a huge financial strain on her family. She said, I'd promised myself if I didn't see a sign by the end of today, I was going to demand that we move back to Virginia. You are my sign. She thanked me, smiling as she left the store. I was flabbergasted, realizing that such a small gesture impacted a whole family. The clerk said as she was checking me out, You know what, girl? You just made my day. I walked out smiling, wondering how many people my act of kindness would affect. The other day I was getting a breakfast sandwich and coffee and thought my co-workers might like some donuts. The four guys I work with at the stables live in little apartments at the front of the barns. None of them have a car, but they share a bike. I explained to them that the donuts were for them. The look of gratitude on each of their faces was rewarding in an immeasurable way. I haven't really worked here all that long, and I think that those 12 small donuts helped to break the ice a little bit. My small act of kindness turned into something huge as the week went on. We started looking out for one another more carefully and working like a team. The third way to connect to intention is to be love. Ponder these words thoughtfully. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in me, and I in him. That is God talking, so to speak, keeping in mind the central theme of this chapter, and in fact, this entire program, that you must learn to be like the energy that allowed you to be here in the first place, then being in a state of love is absolutely necessary for you to reconnect to intention. For the purposes of this chapter, I'd like you to think about love in the following two ways. First, love is cooperation rather than competition. What I'd like you to be able to experience right here in physical form on planet Earth is the essence of the spiritual plane. If this were possible, it would mean that your very life is a manifestation of love. Were this to be true for you, you'd see all of life living together in harmony and cooperating with each other. You'd sense that the power of intention that originates all life cooperates with all other life forms to ensure growth and survival. You'd note that we all share the same life force and the same invisible intelligence that beats my heart and your heart beats the heart of everyone on this planet. And secondly, love is the force behind the will of God. I'm not suggesting the kind of love that we define as affection or sentiment, nor is this kind of love a feeling that seeks to please and press favors on others. Imagine a kind of love that is the power of intention, the very energy that is the cause behind all of creation. It's the spiritual vibration that carries divine intentions from formless to concrete expression. It creates new thought form, changes matter, vivifies all things, and holds the cosmos together beyond time and space. It's in every one of us. It is what God is. Our fourth way of reconnecting to intention. Be beauty. Emily Dickinson once wrote, Beauty is not caused, it is. As you awaken to your divine nature, you'll begin to appreciate beauty in everything you see and touch and experience. You were brought into this world from that which perceived you as an expression of beauty. It couldn't have done so if it thought you to be otherwise. For if it has the power to create, it also possesses the power not to do so. The choice to do so is predicated on the supposition that you're an expression of loving beauty. This is true for everything and everyone that emanates from the power of intention. Here's a favorite story of mine that illustrates appreciating beauty where you once didn't. It was told by... Guru Mai, in her beautiful book, Kindle My Heart. Quote, There was a man who did not like his in-laws because he felt they took up more space in the house than they should. He went to a teacher who lived nearby, as he had heard a lot about him, and he said, Please, please, do something. I cannot bear my in-laws anymore. I love my wife, but my in-laws, never. They take up so much space in the house, somehow I feel that they're always in my way. Well, the teacher asked him, Do you have some chickens? Yes, I do, he said. Then put all of your chickens inside the house. He did what the teacher said and then went back to him, and the teacher asked, Is the problem solved? He said, No, it's worse. Do you have any sheep? He asked, Yes. 
Well, bring all the sheep inside. He did so, and he returned to the teacher. He said, is the problem now solved? He said, no, it's getting worse. He says, well, then do you have a dog? He said, well, yes, I have. I have several. Well, he said, take all of those dogs back into the house. Finally, the man ran back to the teacher and said, I came to you for help, but you're making my life worse than ever. The teacher said to him, now send all the chickens, the sheep, and the dogs back outside. The man went home and emptied the house of all the animals. There was so much space, he went back to the teacher. Thank you, he said. Thank you. You've solved all my problems. Number five, as a way to connect to intention, be ever expansive. The next time you see a garden full of flowers, observe the flowers that are alive and compare them to the flowers that you believe are dead. What's the difference? The dried up, dead flowers are no longer growing, while the alive flowers are indeed still growing. The all-emerging universal force that intended you into beingness and commences all of life is always growing and perpetually expanding. As with all seven of these faces of intention, by reason of its universality, it must have a common nature with yours. By being in a state of ever-expanding and growing intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually, you're identifying with the universal mind. Sixth, be abundant. Intention is endlessly abundant. There's no scarcity in the universal, invisible world of spirit. As you contemplate connecting to intention, know in your heart that any attitude that you have that reflects a scarcity consciousness will hold you back. A reminder here is in order. You must match intention's attributes with your own in order to capitalize on those powers in your own life. When you shift to an abundance mindset, you repeat to yourself over and over and over again that you're unlimited because you emanated from the inexhaustible supply of intention. As this picture solidifies, you begin to act on this attitude of unbending intent. There's no other possibility. We become what we think about. And as Emerson reminded us, quote, the ancestor to every action is a thought, unquote. As these thoughts of plenitude and excessive sufficiency become your way of thinking, the all-creating force to which you're always connected will begin to work with you in harmony with your thoughts, just as it worked with you in harmony with your thoughts of scarcity. If you think you can't manifest abundance into your life, you'll see intention agreeing with you and assisting you in the fulfillment of meager expectations. I personally seem to have arrived into this world fully connected to the abundance attributes of the spiritual world from which I emanated. As a child growing up in foster homes with poverty consciousness all around me, I was the richest kid in the orphanage, so to speak. I always thought I could have more money jingling in my pockets. I pictured it there, and I consequently acted on that picture. I'd collect soda pop bottles, shovel snow, bag groceries, cut lawns, carry out people's ashes from their coal furnaces, clean up yards, paint fences, babysit, deliver newspapers, and on and on and on. And always the universal force of abundance worked with me in providing opportunities. A snowstorm was a giant blessing for me. So too were discarded bottles by the side of the road and little old ladies who needed help carrying their groceries to their automobiles. Today, over a half a century later, I still have that abundance mentality. In a sense... I'm still collecting pop bottles, shoveling snow, and carrying out groceries for little old ladies. My vision hasn't changed, although the playing field is enlarged. It's all about having an inner picture of abundance, thinking in unlimited ways, and being open to the guidance that intention provides when you're in a state of rapport with it. And then being in a state of ecstatic gratitude and awe for how this whole thing works. Every time I see a coin on the street, I stop, I pick it up, put it into my pocket, and I say out loud, Thank you, God, for this symbol of abundance that keeps flowing into my life. Never, never once have I ever said, Why only a penny, God? You know I need a lot more than that. On this day, today, on a writing day, I arise at 4 a.m. with a knowing that my writing will complete what I've already envisioned in the contemplations of my imagination. The writing flows and letters arrive from intentions manifest abundance urging me to read a particular book or talk to a unique individual and I know that it's all working in perfect abundant unity. The phone rings and just what I need to hear is resonating in my ear. I get up to get a glass of water and my eyes fall on a book that's been on my bookshelves for 20 years but this time I feel compelled to pick it up. I open it and once again I'm being directed by Spirit's willingness to assist and guide me as long as I stay in harmony with it. It goes on and on and on in my life and I'm reminded of Rumi's poetic words from 800 years ago, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. And finally, the seventh way of reconnecting to intention. 
It's called being receptive. The universal mind is ready to respond to anyone who recognizes their true relationship to it. It will reproduce whatever conception of itself that you impress upon it. In other words, it's receptive to all who remain in harmony with it and stay in a relationship of reverence for it. The issue becomes a question of your receptivity to the power of intention. Stay connected and know you'll receive all that this power is capable of offering. Take it on by yourself as separate from the universal mind, an impossibility, but nevertheless a strong belief of the ego, and you remain eternally disconnected. The nature of the universal mind is peaceful. It isn't receptive to force or violence. It works in its own time and rhythm, allowing everything to emanate by and by. It's in no hurry because it's outside of time. It's always in the eternal now. Try getting down on your hands and knees and hurrying along a tiny tomato plant sprout. Universal spirit is at work peacefully, and your attempts to rush it or tug new life into full creative flower will destroy the entire process. Being receptive means taking on a position of allowing your senior partner to handle your life for you. I accept the guidance and assistance of the same force that created me. I let go of my ego and I trust in this wisdom to move at its own peaceful place. I make no demands on it. This is how the all-creating field of intention creates. This is how you must think in order to reconnect to your source. You practice meditation because it allows you to receive the inner knowing of making conscious contact with God. By being peaceful, quiet, and receptive, you pattern yourself in the image of God, and you regain the power of your source. This is what this chapter, and indeed, this entire program is all about. That is, tapping into the essence of originating spirit, emulating the attributes of the creative force of intention, and manifesting into your life anything that you desire that's consistent with the universal mind, which is creativity, kindness, love, beauty, expansion, abundance, and peaceful receptivity. This concludes the steps for connecting to intention. But before you make this somersault into the inconceivable, I urge you to examine any and all self-imposed obstacles that need to be challenged and eradicated as you work anew at living and breathing this power of intention that was placed in your heart before a heart was even formed. As William Penn once put it, those people who are not governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. <laughs>